on this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, voice assistants are the new hotness, and this time Alexa might be showing up in the places where you least expect it. Probably heard of the saying, work smarter, not harder. Well, cybersecurity teams need to start following that mantra, and Curtis is going to take us through it. Plus, edge computing has become part of the new distributed workforce. We have Alexis Crowell, Intel's IoT Marketing Global Lead, and she's here to take us through simple solutions to ensure the success of your organization. Shouldn't miss it. Twyatt on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 409, recorded September 4th, 2020. IoT it. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. WWT's advanced technology centers like no other testing and research lab with more than a half a billion dollars of equipment, including solutions from key partners like HPE and Intel. And it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more about WWT and the ATC and become a member of their growing community, go to WWT.com slash twit. And by IT Pro TV. Get the best well-rounded IT education from the experts. Visit ITPro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use code enterprise30 at checkout. And by Things to Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off, and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the How Do You Hear About Us box. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in the Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, how's the uh, packing pod treating you? Um, The lab is pretty much empty. I'm down now to just throwing stuff away and, you know, giving a few things. Actually, probably next week, I'm going to try and start posting some 360 degree videos. Um, of the empty cool. lab, it's the end of his, end of an era. Uh, all Did you kinds find of gear that went you, to uh, my that, you, that was hidden away. Did you find anything that was hidden away that was uh, there for years you didn't know was there? Oh yeah, God! I I bought all kinds of Cat Five E, you know, cables and stuff. And I found that and a whole bunch of fiber and you know different oh, things man. all tucked away, nice and neat in the loft. And it's like Padre, I swear <laughs> I, that that boy was. Mr. OCD, and he'd love to come in after hours and clean up my lab. <laughs> Sounds like my wife. Sounds like my wife. Well, that's okay. Well, thanks for being here, Brian. Now, our, we also also welcome in Mr. Curtis Franklin. He is the senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, uh, how's how's going? How's things going down there in Florida? How's the weather? Well, just at the moment, we have a storm rolling through, so uh, nice randomizing factor thrown in. But the good news is that it's cooling things off. We were in the mid-90s earlier this afternoon, all the way down to 88. So uh, uh, we're heading in the right direction, uh, getting a big dose of what we like to call here in Florida liquid sunshine. That's right. That's right. Now, you're, you're gearing up for interrupts coming pretty soon. Is there anything in between that? No, uh, the big thing coming up is is interop. Uh, after interop, we've got a big virtual conference happening for dark reading. It's a one day affair, uh, so we'll have more information on that. But uh, right now, everything we're looking at is virtual, and I have to admit, I've got a number of vendor related conferences I'm going to be going to in cyberspace. Uh, still thinking that maybe with a little bit of luck and a good tailwind, we'll be able to do some in-person conferences come Q4 
quarter one of 2021. Thanks, Curtis, for he- being here. Well, speaking of gearing up, we've had a busy week in Enterprise. We should get started. Now, voice assistants are the new hotness. I remember when bots were the same thing previous years. Well, this time Alexa is showing up in all different places, especially places you least expect it, maybe at the gas pump. Now, you probably heard the saying, work smarter, not harder. Well, cybersecurity teams need to start following this mantra, and Curtis is going to take us through how they can do that. Plus, edge computing has become part of the new distributed workforce. DevOps teams need new tools as part of that workflow to manage their devices. And we have Alexis Crowell. She's the Intel's IoT Marketing Global Lead, and she's here to take us through the simple solutions that ensure your organization's success. But before we get into all that goodness, let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, there isn't a week that goes by that we don't talk about privacy and that Facebook is part of that discussion. However, we talked about the iOS changes that are going to actually impact Facebook's ad revenue when it comes to tracking your behaviors across the web. Well, it looks like the stink Facebook has been making about this has finally got Apple's attention. Now, if you remember, there's a new requirement that advertisers who include an Apple-provided tracking identifier must now show a pop-up notification asking for tracking permissions. When enabled, a system prompt will allow users to allow or reject that tracking on an app by app basis. Now, we want to give they want to actually give developers time they need to make the necessary changes. As a result, they require the use of tracking permission will go actually in effect earlier next year. That's interesting, right? Because you think Facebook may have made some impact here? We'll see. Now, this includes changes to the privacy policy that would could have reduced the ad sales by Facebook, and they're really worried about that because they target a lot of iPhones and iPads. Now, this just goes to show you that public campaigns against policy and feature changes do sometimes become a forcing function to stop those changes. My guess is Epic Games was hoping their campaigns worked as well. Well, DHS is partnering with industry to offer state and local governments cybersecurity aid. The Malicious Domain Block and Reporting, or MDBR, service is a partnership among the DHS's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, you usually hear it referred to as CISA, the Center for Internet Security, and Akamai. The year-long project to make state and local government networks and systems more difficult to hack currently serves 346 of the approximately 40,000 state, local, tribal, or territorial governments in the United States. Now, MDBR acts as the DNS servers for participating governments, blocking a variety of suspicious and malicious sites, known malware channels, and phishing domains while reporting trends back to CISA, which will use the information to create threat intelligence feeds for government agencies. Local governments are at particular risk as they typically have razor-thin budgets and no full-time cybersecurity specialists. In 2019, more than 163 ransomware attacks targeted local and county government agencies and organizations. The DNS filtering and blocking technology central to MDBR comes from Akamai, but it's not unique to that company. OpenDNS, which started in 2006 and was acquired by Cisco in 2015, made the approach popular, and several other cybersecurity firms have similar technology. The thing that makes Akamai unique, however, is its scope. The company's network currently processes about 2 trillion DNS requests every day. Since 2016, the DHS has become a primary source of threat intelligence for state and local governments, but government agencies, including the cybersecurity functions at DHS, are often criticized for their lack of information sharing. This latest initiative could change or at least mitigate those concerns. A court case has just ruled that the feds can't ask Google for every phone in a 100-meter radius. So it was the federal courts in the Chicago area that have three times rejected government applications for warrants to force Google to produce a list of smartphones near two particular commercial establishments during one of three 45-minute intervals. The most recent ruling was handed down last week and recently made public. The decisions are significant because Google has reported massive growth in law enforcement use of such geofence searches. Google says there are were 1,500% increase between 2017 and 2018 and a further 600% jump from 2018 to 2019. 
That's a hundredfold increase in two years. Google received 180 geofence search requests a week during 2019, according to the folks at CNET. Google is a popular target for this kind of request because almost everyone uses Google products in one way or another. Google's Android controls a majority of the smartphone market, and even most users who run iPhones use apps like Google Maps and Gmail. Moreover, Google frequently has GPS data that places a user phone to within a few meters, much more accurate than the tower location data law enforcement can get from wireless providers. And these dragnet searches can capture a lot of data. In one case last year, Google was required to hand over information about almost 1,500 users to federal investigators working on a Wisconsin arson case. If the Chicago ruling is upheld on appeal, it could place new limits on broad government data requests. That would force governments to be more discriminating when they ask Google or other technology and wireless companies for data about their customers' locations. Well, this is one of those double-edged sword decisions. Geofencing allows for monitoring the comings of the bad guys without putting agents into the danger area. But it's a mighty big net to throw, and this is where they run afoul of the folks in the civil liberties groups. Now, the European Union is currently preparing for a significant overhaul of its core platform regulation, the e-commerce directive. Now, this year, the European Commission and the EU's executive pledged to reshape Europe's, Europe's digital future and propose an entirely new rule package called the Digital Services Act, or DSA for sure. Now, the model is supposed to address platforms' legal responsibilities regarding user content and include measures to keep users safe online. Now, the commission also announced a new standard for large platforms that act as gatekeepers to create a fairer and more competitive market for online platforms in the EU. Now, since the European Commission has not yet published this proposal for the DSA, the EFF felt it was a good time to remind them of a few things. Now, they focused on the e-commerce directive that has been crucial for the growth of the online economy and the protection of fundamental rights in the EU. They actually believe it's essential to retain the directive's approach of limiting platforms' liability over U.S. content. Also, banning the member states from requiring obligations to track and monitor the users' content. Now, the EFS wanted to ensure broken things were also fixed, like a version of the Internet where users have right to remain anonymous, enjoy substantial procedural fairness in the context of content moderation, and can have more control over how they interact with the content. Now, that sounds like good Internet to me, if you think about it. Now, they felt it should also include measures to make sure the use of algorithms were more transparent, However, they also allow people to choose whether they want algorithms to curate their feeds at all. Now, giving users the rights and options they deserve is really what their focus is here. Now, they are also proposing that interoperability obligations for large platforms. Now, that's flanked by strong privacy and security safeguards. Now, the European commitment to interoperability could empower users to shape their online environments. Now, this would ensure the focus was on their needs and preferences. Now, it allow people to connect with each other beyond the walled gardens of the largest platforms and reinvigorate the digital economy. Now, the EFF is pushing hard for regulations to bring more power back to the users. Now, if you're interested in this as well and want to get involved, you should do it now because check on the European Commission's public consultation website and submit your comments there today. Well, in what probably ranks as the least surprising headline of 2020, most IoT hardware is dangerously easy to crack. A vast majority of IoT hardware in homes and offices is vulnerable to attacks that allow devices to be easily taken over and manipulated for malicious purposes. Few device manufacturers or security researchers are paying nearly as much attention to this issue as they are to software vulnerabilities, according to Mark Rogers, a white hat hacker and executive director of cybersecurity at Okta. At Okta's virtual disclosure security conference on Wednesday, Rogers described most most IoT hardware is having very weak to no protections against attacks aimed at prying secrets from device firmware. Rogers claimed he was able to gain complete root-level access, including the ability to reflash firmware, on 10 out of 12 devices he tested. Most, he said, were cracked in less than five minutes. The issue with all of these systems, and indeed all IoT devices, is that most proprietary information about the device, including certificates, keys, and communication protocols, is typically stored in poorly secured flash memory. 
just as security researchers' intense scrutiny on smart car technologies is driving change there, there is a need for similar focus on IoT hardware weaknesses. Technologies are available that allow manufacturers to build more secure hardware, and costs to do so are dropping, Rogers said. Quote, we really don't have much excuse not to implement some security into hardware. Well, iOS 13.7 was launched Tuesday with a new system for battling the pandemic. Tuesday brought a surprise update to iOS 13. iOS 13.7 adds Exposure Notification Express, the next phase of Apple and Google's collaboration to aid local, regional, and national governments in tracking COVID-19 exposure and isolating those infected iOS 13.7 adds a few additional minor features and is joined by iPad OS 13.7, which mostly includes bug fixes. Google will launch its own version of Exposure Notification Express on Android later this month. Back in April, April, Apple and Google announced a joint plan to develop a system that would use the Bluetooth hardware in iPhones and Android phones to assist in contact tracing amidst the pandemic. Exposure Notifications Express is the moniker for the second phase of this rollout. The first phase began with software updates in May that included an API to help public health authorities develop their own apps for this purpose. Now with this update, those authorities can gain the benefits of high-tech exposure tracking without developing their own apps. In Apple's implementation for iOS, users who are in participating states are prompted to opt opt in to receive notifications if the contact tracing data indicates they may have been exposed. The user is then advised on next steps to take, which are defined by the user's local public health authority. Public health authorities define when and under what conditions notifications are sent, as well as what guidance is provided to those who may have been exposed. So far, Maryland, Nevada, Virginia, and the District of Columbia are participating in the Exposure Notifications Express system, though more may come later. Virginia, North Dakota, Wyoming, Alabama, Arizona, and Nevada have previously launched COVID notification solutions using the API. Also, 20 countries have already launched exposure tracking apps. The new Exposure Notifications Express approach does not impact existing solutions, according to Apple and Google. While the key here is that if a state has already implemented a contact tracing app, this hopefully will not break it. However, if you're like me and want to be part of the solution, it means I can get rolling now on electronic contact tracing, especially since my state seems to be stuck in the mud using woefully understaffed manual contact tracing. So, yes, some of you are going to boo and hiss at me, but I'm willing to say I support electronic contact tracing and happen to think the design preserves more of my privacy than much more intrusive systems like the ones tied to national health system apps like, you know, Singapore and so forth. Yes, I just did the 13.7 iOS update and will be turning on contact tracing on my iPhone, uh, but not quite yet because my state hasn't turned on the feature. Fail. Well, Chibert, this is a good segue into my news blip because you might want to hold off on turning that tracking on the Apple and Google COVID tracking framework that you just mentioned and the one we discussed in previous episodes. Well, we knew that these types of frameworks always spark the creative juices of hackers. Well, just this week, a couple of researchers released a video documenting a privacy breaking flaw in the Apple and Google COVID tracing framework. They're calling the attack little thumb after a French children's story in which a child drops pebbles to be able to retrace his steps. But unlike Hansel and Gretel with the breadcrumbs, the goal of privacy preserving framework is to pre prevent periodic waypoints from allowing you to follow anyone's phone around. Now, the Apple Google framework is in theory quite sound. For instance, the system broadcasts hashed rolling IDs that prevent tracing an individual phone for more than 15 minutes. Since Bluetooth LE has a unique numeric address for each phone like Mac address and other networks, they even thought of changing the Bluetooth address in lockstep to foiled would be trackers. And there's no difference between theory and practice in theory. Now, in practice, the researchers found that a slight difference in timing between changing the Bluetooth BDR address and changing the COVID tracing frameworks rolling proximity IDs can create what they call pebbles, an overlap where the rolling ID was has updated, but the Bluetooth ID 
has not. Now, logging these allows one to associate rolling IDs over time, and an extensive network of Bluetooth listeners could then trace people's movements and possibly attach identities of chains of rolling IDs, breaking one of the framework's privacy guarantees. Now, this timing issue only affects some phones, not all of them. About half of that actually set that was tested. And of course, it's only creating a problem for privacy within the Bluetooth LE range. But for a system that's otherwise so well thought out in its principle, it's flaw that needs fixing. Now, I guess it shows you that even where you opt into tools and apps that use these new frameworks that haven't been battle tested, you better be ready for the hacker light to be shined on you too. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Worldwide Technology. Now, WWT began building their Advanced Technology Center 10 years ago, and it's been growing exponentially. It's like no other testing and research lab you've ever seen. Now, the lab contains more than a half a billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs and key partners ranging from high-tech heavyweights like HPE and Intel to disruptors like Equinix. Now, WWT is a trusted partner who stays with you over the years. Many other customers have been with them over a decade because they know WWT is where they can go to get the answers they need to make sure their businesses run right. Now, their ATC is an incubator for IT innovation. Listen to what it has to offer. Schedulable and on-demand labs like HPE's InfoSight Lab, along with hundreds of other labs representing the newest advances in cloud-based machine learning to provide global insights into the status and health of infrastructure in one location and much more. Now, learn about products before you launch because WWT's engineers use these environments to quickly spin up proof of concepts and pilots using the sandboxes so customers can confidently select the best solutions. Now, in many cases, this reduces concept time from months to weeks with increases speed to market. They offer Lab as a Service, a dedicated space within the ATC. Now, here customers can perform programmatic testing using the vast technology ecosystem that WWT has already built. And it's virtual, so you can take full advantage of the ATC's unique benefits anywhere in the world, 24 Seven. Now, WWT's engineers work in these labs each and every day. They beta test new solutions based on the latest and greatest HPE technologies and build reference architectures and custom integrations to help their customers make decisions to see results faster with much less investment. Now, WWT has launched their new digital platform encompassing that ATC ecosystem. Now, this ecosystem creates a multiplier effect of knowledge, speed, and and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for all of their customers. Get access to articles, case studies, hands-on labs, and the other tools that make the difference in today's fast-paced world. To learn more and discover why organizations across industries turn to WWT to guide them on their digital transformation journey, visit www.wt.com slash twit. And don't forget to create a My WWT account to access resources available through WWT's Advanced Technology Center ecosystem. That's www.com slash twit. WWT, delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. And we thank Worldwide Technology for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, let's jump into the bites. Now, you use a voice assistant. I use a voice assistant. We all do for something, right? Well, maybe asking for a unit conversion, maybe a new story, maybe even just some music. But what about asking for it to pay for your gas? Would you use it? Well, the next time you need to fill up your car, you might pay for gas using your voice. Now, Amazon Exxon and Exxon Mobil and payment provider Fistserve have announced they can pay. You can now pay with Alexa at some of the pumps out there. It's now available at more than 11,500 Exxon and Mobil stations across the U.S. Now, when you pull up to the pump, you can simply ask the voice assistant to pay for gas using your phone or through your car itself if you have an Alexa-enabled voice uh, vehicle or Exa, uh, Echo uh, Auto. Now, Alexa will confirm the station uh, will confirm the station and the pump number with you, and it'll activate the pump. Uh, payment will automatically be handled through Amazon Pay. Now, while you have already been using con- contactless payments at the pump anyways, this option can make your trip to the gas station a little bit more seamless. Well, folks, I want to I want to throw this to my to my co-host because I don't know about you, but this seems like I don't know. I obviously with the current pandemic going on, a lot of people want to want to touch those units or enter their code or anything like that. 
The question is, is this going to be easier? Is it going to make things easier? Cheaper, I want to throw this to you. you know, can, do you think this is going to be able to recognize individual users well enough? It sounds like there's going to be exploits here. I'm sure there's going to be exploits, but I've already started seeing some changes in how I use my Amazon Echo. It's now asking uh, who I am, you know, so it's trying, basically, it's creating voice profiles between all the different users of the Amazon Echo system within my account. Um, so that's going to be a pretty big difference. There's already a lot of changes happening into the Echo system. Um, I've been seeing how just moving around my home, the Echo system is now feeling more localized. Um, so it's it's can now tell whether I'm in one room or another. Anyway, the point I'm getting at is, yeah, with a lot of the changes and things you know happening, especially I'm hoping to get some real interesting insight from our guest, the IoT world and especially what's happening with the Amazon Echo um, infrastructure is that it's getting more directional, it's getting more localized, and it's actually starting to get a lot better at recognizing voices. So someone somewhere along the line is putting a lot of effort into those uh, systems. Uh, I already know that this is a, could be a problem. Um, some of my friends in the Northeast actually had their gas cards hacked out from under them um, because they can pay with their phone it, just as they pull into a gas station. So live and learn. Sorry, not perfect yet. Uh, I'm sure Amazon's reading up on those particular hacks. So maybe, just maybe, it might be good. I actually really like the concept. I'm still going to wear a um, nitrile glove on my right hand so that I don't have to share my germs on the gas pump handle with everybody. Um, but not having to go and stick my credit card in there, not having to go and type in this or that or that or this – might go a long way towards maybe me not getting COVID-19. But even still, uh, one of the dirtiest things on the planet is a gas pump. So not having to touch things is really great. And maybe someday there'll be a robot that'll open up my gas tank and fill it for me so I don't have to even get out of the car. Who knows? I don't know. We'll see. Cheaper. Yeah, I, I will throw this to Curtis. Curtis, are you seeing these down there in Florida at all? Have you heard anything about their deployment? Because 11,500 stations is sounds like it's almost critical mass there for getting people to adopt it. You know, it does sound like a fair number of stations. Um, I will admit I have not tried this. I haven't sought one out. Uh, but I do think it's a, it's a very good extension of something that, that I like from a security perspective, and that is... Uh, using your mobile device, using your mobile ecosystem as a payment method rather than a physical payment card. The big reason that it's more secure is that these are paid for with a one-time token so that even if a hacker does manage to intercept the transaction and sniff that traffic, they can't use it. You know, it's a one-time token that's used for that transaction and, and is useless in the future. I think that is really where things are going. The banks, the payment companies, uh, the financial tech companies all love this idea because it minimizes uh, fraud. And every company in that space has a, a number, a, a percentage that is their bearable fraud rate. And it's usually somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half to three and a half percent. But if they can lower that, then that's definitely money in their pocket. And they would tell you money back to the consumer because they don't have to build cost fraud into things like their interest rates. Right, right, right. Well, folks, I think that put one that put that one to bed. Um, I'm actually interested in trying this out uh, because, like Cheebert said, I I don't tend to drive around, unfortunately, with nitro gloves. I probably should, uh, and this would definitely help. Unfortunately, I still have to touch the pump, uh, but uh, but hopefully that will uh, make it easier in the future too. Uh, so I think that, let's jump into the next bike because I think Curtis has a pretty interesting one. I, I'm always trying to coach my employees: work smarter, not harder. And you know what? It definitely should apply to cybersecurity teams as well. Curtis? 
Oh, absolutely. Now, here on Twyat, we have covered to a pretty good extent the fact that cybersecurity jobs are high stress, they are in high demand, and the turnover is intense compared to most other security jobs. Cybersecurity teams turn over their members far too often. Well, a number of analysts and researchers say that one of the ways that companies can slow down that turnover and make people happy to stay in the positions longer is to reduce the stress and reduce the emotional impact of a cybersecurity position. One of the ways, work smarter rather than harder. Now, there is no question that security budgets have, by and large, not kept pace with the rising threat level brought on by COVID-19. Gartner predicts cybersecurity leaders should expect budget decreases over the next year as companies put more of their money into their basic business processes. So hiring additional headcount, making things easier by adding people, is not a solution that's going to be around in the coming year and possibly for most of our careers. The question is, how do you make it better? So one of the writers at um, Dark Reading put together a list of five things that, that can really help. Now, number one is understand the business. You know, we've talked a lot about cybersecurity being a business problem. If you can explain what you need in business terms, rather than cybersecurity terms, you've got a leg up. Acknowledge the complexity. Even in the best of times, cybersecurity is a complicated process. The work from home, the renewed emphasis on mobile and disparate infrastructure has made it even more complex. Add in things like regulations, and it's a huge issue. Acknowledge that and work with it, rather than trying to tell people, well, it's really simple, you don't have to be concerned. You might wanna reassess some of those business models. <clears throat> Why? Because by doing so, you can make the business and cybersecurity be more in sync. And that's a critical process as well. When you're trying to fight the battle on multiple planes, well, that's a recipe for stress and ultimately to failure. Commit to automation. You know, there are in fact tools out there they can make things better. And if there is a silver lining in all this, it's that we've seen dramatic improvements in the automation of a lot of cybersecurity processes. Companies that rely on manual processes and manual uh, techniques are going to find themselves ever more behind. Finally, understand your adversary. You know, there are a lot of people out there doing great research on the adversaries, the malicious actors in the cybersecurity world. If you pretend that knowing them isn't important, well, you're wrong and you're going to end up paying the price for that. Don't do it. Learn all you can about your adversaries, what they want, what tools they're using, and the which techniques they're using to end up on the inside of your network. I want to bring my my co-host in. Brian, I'm going to turn to you because you've spent so much of your career in cybersecurity. These five steps, you know, explaining things in business terms, knowing your adversary, use automation, do any of these surprise you? Do you do you hear anything in that that, that strikes you as not making sense? No, they all make a lot of sense, lots and lots of sense. But I'd probably add one more, um, and that's know your infrastructure. Too few 
of cybersecurity experts that I've talked to don't even know the inventory of their network. You know, you'd be surprised. Um, like, for instance, let's use an example. Um, when Tim Titus first started introducing TotalView uh, from his company, Path Solutions, you would not believe the number of people that were absolutely flabbergasted to find out that they still had some really, really, really old print servers that were at 10 meg half duplex. That tells me there's a big gap in the knowledge of what makes up your infrastructure. Too many networks have grown organically, and those are where the holes start appearing. So I'd like to add number six, know thy infrastructure, because it's going to bite you if you don't if you don't have a good inventory. You know, I love that idea. And I have talked to a lot of people who said that the way the, the attackers get ahead is that the CISO, the CIO, tends to have a very good idea of what the network looked like the day it went live. The attacker makes it their business to understand the network as it exists today. And that delta is where a lot of vulnerability lies. Lou, I want to come to you because I'd like to get your ideas about this notion of understanding the business that you're in and trying to protect. When, when you look at the, the IT infrastructure from both a hardware and a software side, how important is it, do you think, to try and wrap your head around this from a business perspective rather than just a technology perspective? You have, you have to know the impact because what could happen is if, if technology and issues impact the technology, that will also impact different parts of your business. I'll give you an example. In a lot of CRM-based organizations I worked with in the past, uh, and there was one that did a lot of field service. Let's say they're a, a cable company that has field service people out there doing, uh, you know, tickets and customer service tickets. Um, and, you know, this has to be remote. And if they can't access the network or can't access the tickets, there's no way. Then they have to use the phones and and, this, and th these app, these uh, the services don't scale well on the phone. And so it's much harder for them to, to be able to be on time and handle the business. And so really having the technology people, IT pros, understand the business so they can understand the flow of data, understand where they need to where the where the potential vulnerabilities are in the pipeline and understand how to scale uh, the network and ensure um, you know uh, disaster recovery and 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 rollover and consistency, data consistency and all of these things as part um, backup of recovery as part of the pipeline. Um, can ensure that business can go on as usual. And I think that's a really important thing. A lot of IT pros, um, some engineers even go into it thinking, I just have these requirements, I'm going to go build it. But I don't know the, the entire big picture, the complete picture of everything. And so understanding what the business is and how it runs as part of that workflow is super important here. And I think it will help you in the long run uh, when it comes to uh, adding processes and, uh, and, and, and handling issues in, in place, for sure. Yeah, I think that notion that you can get away with and build a career on keeping a very, very narrow focus is one of those ideas that has kind of gone by the wayside. Whether you're building the infrastructure or protecting the infrastructure, understanding how it serves the business is critical for long-term success and as we're seeing here short-term survival well that's it for this bite got a great guest coming up and to head us off in that direction lou i'm going to turn it back over to you thank you curtis well, before I get to the my favorite part of the show, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twiat Riot. Today, we actually have a really great, another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that is IT Pro TV. Now, you're a busy professional. I'm a busy professional. It can be difficult to learn the skills or develop skills to make a career change. And having been in the tech field for a long time, I can tell you, you need all forms of training when entering new field. And IT Pro TV makes it sure that you have all you need to learn IT. Now, their instructors make learning IT entertaining. Now, IT Pro TV also provides you with virtual labs, so you have the ability to try out the skills 
you just learn and you won't have to purchase expensive hardware or deal with setup because they run those things on virtual machines with multiple instances of Windows servers and desktop clients. And they work on your OS X, or your, your Mac, your Linux, your iOS device, and of course, your Windows platform. Now, IT Pro TV gives you the opportunity to truly be ready for your IT certification test with their practice test. Now, get ready for exams, questions covering Microsoft, CompTIA, EC Council, PMI, and many, many, many more. Now, with IT Pro TV, you can also have the opportunity to supplement your education with webinars featuring hot topics in the tech world, as well as events and podcasts. You can actually check out their podcast, Technado, with Don Pezzett, featuring industry guests and IT news recaps. Now, IT Pro TV, make sure you have a well-rounded education that will set you up for success in your future IT career, for sure. Now, with over 5,800 hours of IT training, IT Pro TV is the best place to go for getting started or expanding your IT career. Now, earn certificate certificates in A+, CCMP, and so many more, including CompTIA. IT Pro TV is also the official video training partner for CompTIA and has 12 CompTIA on-demand courses for you that take take courses from networking skills or security skills, Linux, Apple, and more. Sign up for a premium membership and let an expert guide you with setting goals and implementing the IT training program for you to help you reach those goals. Invest in yourself and your future with IT Pro TV. Get the IT training you need from the experts. Go to IT Pro. Dot tv slash enterprise and, and use the code enterprise 30 to receive 30 percent off all consumer subscriptions that's it pro dot tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise 30 for an additional 30 percent off for the lifetime of your active subscription it pro tv build or expand your it career and enjoy the journey and we thank it pro tv for their support of this week in enterprise tech well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We actually bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twi, right? Today we have Alexis Crowell. She's Intel's IoT marketing global lead. Alexa, welcome to the show. <laughs> Whoops. Alexis, welcome to the show. I just activated <laughs> everyone's uh, IoT device. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time by any means. Yeah. Thanks for having me, though. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Now, our audience loves to hear people's journey through tech, their, their origin stories. Can you maybe take us on a short journey and what brought you to Intel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started at Intel, God, 16 years ago, I think at this point, um, all on software. I am a software girl at heart. So I've always been on the marketing and on the, on the business side of things, but um, I've been really tightly connected into what we've done in open source. I ran that uh, marketing group for quite a while. Um, most recently, I ran our AI marketing efforts and what we were doing both from training all the way through inference and deployment um, in that space. And as you mentioned, right now I run IoT marketing for the company, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, and I, IoT is a lot of fun. IoT is a huge topic. Orgs, orgs all over the industry are trying to handle the complexity behind it all, like large amounts of data coming in, security problems, deployments and updates. What are you seeing the industry doing here? What are they? How are they handling these things? Uh, you know, everybody's handling it a little differently. Um, in some places, I see people super excited and diving in and, and figuring out where to start. In some places, there's honestly analysis by paralysis, um, and they're just not really sure where to start and how to get going. You know, your conversation was really interesting about the infrastructure because heterogeneity is a way of life. Right. So how do we help make that easier for people to bring more tech in and solve their problems and still solve for the fact that they're going to have different types of infrastructure and and make the development and the deployment of those infrastructure pieces easier? So, you know, in some right. places we're seeing really great adoption. People are taking um, especially AI and machine learning. Uh, they're, you know, grabbing onto it, coming up with some really great solutions. And in some places we're still trying to help people uh, get over some of the I'll call it an industry inertia that's been around for you know decades and we kind of got to kick into the next revolution right right yeah i think you brought a, a good, good good point here like obviously a lot of organizations are trying to handle you know you know all these devices being out there the edge computing devices iot devices uh and the amount of data the sheer amount of volume of data yeah what are you seeing how are they how are they handling this are they and, and maybe some of the solutions you guys are providing to help with that yeah, happy to. So it's um, in a quick context setting, right? The analysts generally believe that in about five years, there will be 10x the amount of data created in a year than that there is this year. Um, and what's, I think, kind of fascinating about that is it's 75% of that 10x data is actually created outside the data center. So think on the manufacturing floors, on the, in the retail stores, um, 
in your favorite fast food restaurant. Um, so, I mean, the best way to harness that, you know, from our perspective is, well, let's move some of the compute to where that data is being created because then you can analyze it um, and act on it much faster, right? You're not having to send everything back. You're not trying to weed through um, reams and reams and petabytes of data to actually come up with a way to make your business run better or delight your customers or um, decrease your operating costs. So if you think about like retail, I think retail is a really good example right now, given what's happening uh, with the pandemic and trying to help customers feel safe as well as help employees feel safe. Uh, we've worked with a company that's deploying a solution that can actually bring inferencing into kind of the monitoring process. And what I mean by that is, you know, if your store has a face mask policy, right, you can deploy a solution from Sensormatic that uses their existing cameras, a retail store's existing cameras to just check and see, hey, is there a face mask on? I don't have to send an, a, an employee to stand there and watch and potentially put another employee, you know, close to, um, close to customers. You can also, uh, this solution also looks at, hey, you know, this is probably a family group. You know, these three three or four people that are standing together, they're probably from the same family, so they can be close together. They don't have to be socially distanced. So that way of connecting AI into an existing store is helping retailers think differently about how they provide service to their end customers, you know? and. My desire being, you know, kind of an economic girl at heart is that, you know, we can help get the economy kind of back up and running with solutions like this that still give people access to the goods and services they need, but help them feel safe at the same time. Right, right. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing here is it, you bring retail into it. I mean, obviously, retailers, all, they're all over the world, all over globally. They're in, you know, they're in remote locations that might have harsh environments. What mm -hmm. what are you seeing here? Like how are you, how are some organizations handling this, especially with the data streams and needing to have you know reliability and and ensure that those devices are up to date and they're managed appropriately, especially in these remote locations. Yeah, it's a great question. So. Um you know, the connectivity and the network become a really big part of IoT. Um, you know, and IoT, can you can look at it as an individual device. Or you look at it the collection of systems, which is what we think about. Um, and mm -hmm. connections in that network, um, either back to uh, some sort of central point, whether that's a, a wholly owned data center, back to a public cloud, whatever, um, or even the network edge, helps make sure that those systems can stay updated too, right? I mean, one of the most expensive things for retailers is rolling a truck to update technology within their stores. So if we can get the connectivity, even in remote locations, to be able to push and do remote manageability, now we're saving a ton of operating costs because they can manage it centrally, but still have the data and the information stay locally within that geography or, or that that harsh environment. You know, you asked about harsh environments. My favorite story, honestly, is uh, we worked with an energy company to build an AI-based robot that would go um, submerge itself in the ocean and check out oil rigs, right? And look for rust, look for wear and tear, look for things that could cause problems, right? Think of preventative maintenance style. Um, so, I mean, that's an environment where you don't want to send a human, right? You don't necessarily want a scuba diver going down into super cold, deep, dark waters um, to check the welds and the bolts and to make sure everything's in place. Um, but you can send a robot, have it do real-time checking, right? Because there's an algo that's built to check whether or not there's possible issues. And then you can flag that because even that, that robot is connected back to a centralized point to go do a deeper investigation if you need to do it. Right, right. Now, Jibby, you do lots of remote deployments. Uh, this has to resonate with you, right? Yeah, in fact, it was um, almost 10 years ago today that I tried to do a project in Curry Atoll at the very northern tip of the Hawaiian Island chain. And communications was a big deal it, to the point where I actually had to go and invest a lot of money to put computing out in the edge so that I could run models. So instead of... Mm -hmm constantly sending a data stream back and my iridium data communications cost would have been atrocious. Uh, mm -hmm. We started doing some very, very um, simplistic AI models uh, to find out whether or not we had a change in the environment. And then and only then do we fire up the uh, expensive communications. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the the neural processor that Intel uh, put out, the USB one, I've been playing with for a while. And 
models are a big, big, big deal for scientists. Mm -hmm. And being able to deploy models with um, more complexity is going to allow us to do a lot better research and a lot better um, communicate, lessen the need for heavy communications. So let's get to the real question. Communication still is a big deal, especially for things mm -hmm. like uh, food supply, um, chain of custodies and things like that. Um, is Intel doing anything with some sort of partnerships with folks like, you know, the AT&T, the T-Mobiles and the Verizons in the world? We've got partnerships with all of the major comm service providers. Um, we've had some great uh, great test cases so far with Verizon on how we can bring 5G into broader use um, and some of the other major players too. So yeah, we, I mean, we look at communication and that connectivity as almost being sta table stakes going forward. Um, you know, you, to your point, that, that connectivity becomes really costly and it could become costly and then difficult to then go, go manage. We want to take that out of the mix as much as we possibly can. You know, we've built our company on open standards, um, specifications and platforms so that then the industry can just innovate and take take flight. And it's the same way we're approaching connectivity and, and what we're doing both in the 5G space as well as a lot of the other connectivity investments um, and work that we're doing, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, et cetera. Super cool. Now, yeah. I've done lots of uh, embedded systems work and one of my biggest frustrations is while the Raspberry Pi has started a huge market, it's also introduced a lot of, let's say, let's call it lazy programming. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> micro SD cards, you know, flash memory is a horrible way of storing secure data. Um, mm -hmm. Too easy to get into and so forth. I have been wishing many, many years for a much more secure platform uh, with better storage. Um, my, I had almost a 90% failure rate on micro SD cards in the field because of the shifting of the fingers on the micro SD card and I get a micro SD card failure out in the field once mm -hmm. it starts getting hot. Mm -hmm. What kind of cool things does Intel have to <laughs> be on my Christmas wish list? <laughs> uh, well, there's some fun stuff that I can't talk about yet, but stay tuned. Um, but there's uh, also, you know, what you're talking about is fundamental to our business, right? We've worked on security and trusted execution environments for a long time. And the way that we're looking at IoT is really the solution construction of the CPUs and the FPGAs. And you mentioned our VPU, the vision processing unit. Um, that, those are the baselines of how we're deploying IoT solutions, right? So if, as I look at companies like Audi that are bringing in computer vision to help um, uh, look at and verify every single weld that they're building or they're putting into a car, that's all based on standard CPU architectures. And that's really helpful because then to your point, you're not having to go out and use, um, you know, kind of purpose. Uh, purposeful uh, single unit devices, you can actually use a broader platform that has all of that robust capability built in. Right, right, right. Well, when we come back, because we have a lot more to talk about, and Curtis has got some questions as well. But before we get to that, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Thinks Canary. Now, with everything that's going on in the world, Thinks Canary wants you to know they're here for you. Now, especially in the current climate, data breaches are on the rise, and companies usually find out too late they have been compromised. And that's after spending millions in IT security. Now, Canary is designed to be installed, configured, and most likely forgotten in minutes. Now, if you need to be alerted, Canary gives you the option of deciding how and when you like to be told, whether it's email or text message right there on your console, or it's just using collab services like Slack, even webhooks, syslog, or just using their API. Now, alerts should be dead simple and easy to work with, conforming to your needs and not the other way around. Thanks, Canary has made that possible. You won't be inundated by alerts. As Get the only ones that matter. Two things all companies should know when it comes to data breaches here. Hackers take the past of least resistance. We talk about it all the time. It's your staff. It takes on. It takes an average of 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. Well, now you're probably wondering, how can Canary help you here? How does it work? Well, it looks identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, or a Windows server, so attackers can't tell the difference. Things Canary don't look vulnerable on your network. They look valuable, appealing. You can put fake files on them or enroll them in an active directory, and when attackers investigate further, they give themselves away 
and you're instantly notified. And the company behind Canary has been in the security game for almost two decades. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks and have used that knowledge to build Canary. Thanks, Canaries are deployed all over the world on seven continents and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Now, having tried this system out, it's really easy and simple to get started, and you can quickly add these things to your network. Do your organization a favor. Get some of these right now. Visit canary.tools slash twit for just $7,500 per year. You'll get five canaries, your own hosted console, upgrades, support, and maintenance. And if you use code twit in the how to hear about us box, you'll get a 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love the Thinks Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit. And to go twit in the how do you hear about us box. And we thank Thinks Canary for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we're talking with Alexis Crowell. She's been talking, telling us about IoT and a lot of the Intel solutions out there. But I did want to bring my other co-host back in, Curtis, because you you have some questions about some of the like machine learning and uh, AL stuff that they're doing, right? Absolutely. And I've got sort of a, a two-prong question. And one of them is, as we look at wanting to move more processing to the edge, how important will artificial intelligence or machine learning be to that process? And second, given how much processing power these technologies really need, how powerful can the machine learning at the edge get if we're talking about packaging that's the size of, of most of our IoT packaging? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, let me maybe address the, the second part first. Um, the the importance of AI, I don't actually think I could probably overestimate that. I mean, there's there's estimates that are anywhere between um, 50 to 75, 78% of AI will actually happen at the edge. Um, you know, and as you kind of tie that second part of your question of how much can you do if you've got smaller form factors, probably limited power supply, um, the capabilities of AI and really ML and some of the new techniques with sparsity um, and we're, as we bring in the ability to run inference and trim down models in a way that can then flag um, for, for someone else to then go intercept, it becomes really important. So let me kind of hard code this with an example. We worked with a company um, to build a solution called TrailGuard. And what that is, is basically a box that you can go put in the wilderness and just keep an eye on the animals and flag if anything is going on, if it's poaching, if it's, you know, some other use case that you're looking for. That lives on a battery um, out in the wild for over a year and a half because all the processing runs on the system itself. It's on a small little VPU. And then it only connects back when necessary. So you can actually do a lot of processing because if you think about that, that algo is looking at, okay, is what is the shape that's in front of me? Is it moving? How is it moving? And does it look like it is moving aggressively or not, right? If you're thinking about the poaching case. Um, and all of that can be done um, and actually all the compute can be done on that little device, which is, you know, about that big, um, on a battery for a year and a half. So there's a lot we the lot we've been able to do. But I think the techniques in AI, whether um, it's pulling things in, um, uh, like the sparsity ability, which is basically trimming out a lot of the, it's not necessarily redundant, but almost fat within an algorithm can actually make the... Um, the ML lasts a lot longer and run a lot longer within a given power envelope. You know, and to the first one, I personally believe, um, and I, I got a lot of laughs when I was in, in the AI job and running AI marketing, because I used to say that, hey, I shouldn't have a job in five years. I actually don't want to be talking about AI or machine learning in five years, because to me, it should be as fundamental and foundational in technology as, you know, having Wi-Fi within your laptop. You don't go look for Wi-Fi in a laptop anymore if you buy it off the shelf. That, to me, is how AI should be going forward because it's really just knowledge at scale. Um, and if you think about it as knowledge at scale versus this technology that's really revolutionizing how we think about computing right now, then it makes sense that we would put it everywhere we possibly can and get more insights out of the data, be able to think through the data a little bit faster, and then be able to act on the data even faster. 
Well, now, I, I have to ask, following up on that, a lot of people, when they talk about artificial intelligence or machine learning, they're basically talking about some variation on shape detection. And even if that shape detection takes the form of natural language processing, it's still a flavor of the same kind of problem that you're trying to solve. When you think of putting artificial intelligence on the edge is that the level of intelligence you're talking about? Or, or do you see AI going farther than that, even on the edge devices? No, no, I absolutely think it'll go farther on the edge devices. Now, I think it'll be the inference side of AI, right? Because if you look at machine learning and deep learning, you've got training, building the model and combing through the millions of pieces of data that will actually spit out your end deployed model. Um, but I think that inference side, especially as techniques like transfer learning come in, reinforcement learning, and the really complex models employ multiple of those, yeah, we can deploy those at the edge. Because the compute power and the capability at the edge is growing tremendously. I mean, if we go back to the earlier comment of we can use CPUs at the edge, get them into small form factors if that's what we need, or you know, whatever the environment might demand, um, that that power, that capability in raw compute exists. And then when you look at the whole system, right, which is really where Intel shines, we are really good at working with the ecosystem and pulling together all of the amazing players, whether it's the software vendors, the SIs, um, the OTSIs, whomever, to actually build a, a whole platform, right? We've got a company that we work with that has built... Um, a completely indestructible box, basically. You know, think black box on an airplane, but it's all for compute. Um, so you can put different levels of compute in those different ecosystems, which means you can then push whatever sort of inference model you're looking for out at the edge. I mean, I think natural language comp then combined with, um, you know, a, a human detection algo is kind of that next step for the Alexa conversation you guys were even having earlier today. Well, I, I've got to, to ask a question based on what you just said. You're talk, sure. talking about profoundly more powerful compute platforms sitting there on, on the edge. And that makes them much more valuable targets for threat actors. We, we've we done a lot of stories here on, on Twiat at Dark Reading, where my day job is. We've done a ton of stories on how vulnerable a lot of these in-place I. IoT devices are. Is Intel doing anything to allow manufacturers to build in better security? Um, and you know, if you are, are you doing things to encourage them to actually implement that better security that's available? Yeah, we've got an entire part of the company that's dedicated to. Um, trying to build the most robust and secure platforms we possibly can that both looks internally with our own development processes, as well as with our customers and partners that are deploying out into the ecosystem. On, it's an area that you can't overinvest. You know, it's an area that you, we absolutely want to keep everything um, as tight and, um, and robust as we possibly can. But that also is actually why putting more compute in those edge devices is valuable because you don't have to then send anything back necessarily over um, uh, any sort of connection pathway. And the data becomes a little bit more, um, uh, it's actually harder to go get because you have to go physically attack the device. Um, you know, So that's where the that balance between compute and connectivity become really important on top of a secure and robust platform. Oh, I, one quick question, because I, I noticed there's a really brand new toolkit out there uh, that's supposed to be helping organizations, especially around IoT devices, called OpenVINO. Can you maybe take us through that and what yeah. it's actually, what this kind of goal is for? Yeah, absolutely. So OpenVINO is designed for um, really developers that are deploying AI models. Um, you know, we talked about heterogeneity at the beginning of this. Where uh, companies and developers want to ultimately land their model can be time consuming to go off and test and figure out how to optimize the model for any given platform. If you're running it on a CPU, if you want to go dump it on a, um, a VPU, an FPGA, whatever that system might be. Uh, so we've actually built a couple of things that are really helpful. First, we built the Dev Cloud for the Edge, which allows customers to go in and it's it's all virtual access. Um, 
And then you can start to test, you know, where is the best deployment path for what I need to go solve for? If I've got a retail store and I'm trying to, um, you know, solve for inventory problems, where does this algorithm sit best? And you can go test it against those different tools. I'm sorry, against those different um, deployment points. OpenVINO is the software side of that deployment platform that optimizes algorithms, right? So if you've got a trained model that you've either built yourself or you're a pre-trained model from somewhere else, we can then not only help you point to the right backend to deploy it, but also optimize it and make it run better, right? Make it run faster, get some more performance out of it. Um, you know, and it's all part of, I mentioned I've got a long history in software. It's all part of our desire to make it really simple for developers, right? We're not confused. Silicon without software, that, th those don't work t Those don't work incongruently. Um, so we spend a lot of time and effort to make the life of a software developer much, much easier, which is what OpenVINO's target is. Well, that's very near and dear to my heart. So that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here, Alexis. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit low on time. I wanted to maybe give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can go learn more about Intel's new solutions, maybe a little bit about OpenVINO. Yeah, absolutely. Go to intel.com. You can search on any of it. Um, we've got connection to even Edge Software Hub, which gives you a whole bunch of starting points. If you want to go get started with your own, uh, own solution, recipes, toolkits, everything you need is right there. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you today. Thanks so much. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another Howard the Best Dang Enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your device to try it. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, starting with our very own Mr. Geek, the Mr. Geek in Paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you in the coming week? And where can people find you online? I'm going to finish packing. I'm tired. <laughs> I My fingers are beat up. My toes have been mashed <laughs> it's a lot of work um cleaning up 15 20 years of lab junk and boy i tell you as i was putting away my intel neural processors and all my single board computers it's like when am i going to move so i can go and start playing with my toys again and um i'm going to keep track of miss crowell it's crowell not cromwell i think and I really want to see what's happening with Intel because there was some IoT platforms from Intel that I was really invested in that um, the market changed. Sorry, but I'm really looking forward to it. Anyway, people, if you want to see what I am doing, I am ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab on Twitter, or you're more than welcome to drop me a line at chibert at twit.tv. Or better yet, why don't you throw email at twiet at twit.tv because then it'll hit all the hosts. Love to hear from you. And um, boy, I'm actually getting really deluged by PR people trying to book um, shows. So <laughs> this is getting interesting. Thanks yes. for watching, everybody. Thanks, g -Bird. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's a senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? Well, I've got a series of articles coming up, including things like what makes a firewall next generation? And what are some of the concepts from DevOps that can readily be applied and should be applied to cybersecurity. So I'm going to be doing that. As always, a lot of my work shows up on the edge of dark reading. Uh, I got some great articles happening there by not only my hand, but a lot of other writers. And you can keep up with what's happening at dark reading and especially my pieces by following me on Twitter, KG4GWA, and over on Instagram at Kurt under. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, I want to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show and get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and get your enterprise news for each week. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and of course, the links that we do during the show. But of course, Next to those videos there, you'll help get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your video version, your audio version of your choice on any one of your podcast applications. We're on Podcatcher, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, you name it. We're there. Definitely subscribe. It's the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. So might as well 
subscribe, right? And after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with giving the gift of Twy. We talk about some fun tech topics here, and I can guarantee they'll find them interesting as well. If not, reach out to us, twyat at twit.tv or over at the twit.community website. Great website there, 24-7 discussion. Check that out because we do some great questions. We get some great content there as well. And, of course, you can always subscribe and listen and, and, and check that out. Now, if you are already subscribed and you want to be part of the live show, we do this each and every week, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. We can check that out at live.twit.tv. Come see how the pizza's made. Come see the behind the scenes, all the fun stuff that we do and all the banter that we have here at Twit. Of course, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the chat room live as well. We have some great set of characters there each and every week. They're here irc.twit.tv that website or just check it out on your favorite irc application it's it's a great chat room they have some great discussions you should be there as well if you can watch the show live you should jump in there and ask some great questions now again if you can't watch the show live you can't be part of the discussion you can't you're just subscribed but you want to be still be part of the discussion check out twit.community great website it's 24 7 discussion the community's out there everyone's out there come join the community at twit.community now remember you can always follow me twitter.com slash lumm there i post all my enterprise tidbits. I have great conversations with people like you. And of course, I post what I do at Microsoft each week, uh, how you customize Office and make it the Office platform work for you and be more productive for you and your organization. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week doing this week in enterprise tech, and we couldn't do this show without them. So thank you so much for all their support. I also want to thank all the engineers at Twit as well. We can do the show without them. And also thank you to Mr. Brian Chi-Chi. But one more time, he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the bookings and the plannings for the show. And we couldn't do the show without him. So thanks again, Chibert, for all your support. Now, before we sign out, we have to thank our editor, Victor. And of course, our TD for today, John. And of course, Burke, I think, is lurking behind there as well. Thank you, guys. How's everything going over there at Twit? Well, it's very quiet around here with uh, just the engineers in and out. So uh, it's the way I like it. Sure, potential vectors. Indeed, indeed. Well, thanks, guys, for being here. And thank you for all your support. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, I'm Jason Howell, host of Hands on Android. Every week, I take a look at the Android operating system and the phone that you have in your hands to tell you how to use it better. Is it tips? Is it tricks? Is it little known secrets, experiments, even emails from fans of the show? You name it, we talk about it on Hands on Android. You can subscribe by going to twit.tv slash HOA and make sure that you do that so you don't miss a single episode. We'll see you there.